Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 207, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with Mr. Bill Volk. Now as you probably know, Bill was there at the very earliest days of the whole mobile gaming phenomenon. Uh, so we spent some time in this video talking about those early days. We also uh, talk about a lot of the current trends and uh, where Bill sees those going, as well as some really fun uh, behind the scenes type stories that I know you're really gonna love, including how Bill saved Activision. A lot of great, great stuff here, so so without further ado, here is Mr. Bill Volk. Where do you think we'll be? Where do you think we'll be in five years? I think it'll be more publisher dominated. I think this can't go on this way. I think you'll have, you know, consolidation and maturation. It'll be more publisher dominated. I think even though everything right now is free to play, free to play, free to play, there is a place for rich paid apps, and I hope that that continues. Um, I, I think. The thing that will surprise you most on the iPhone is is how simplicity is winning out over and over again. So take the game of Pictionary. Pictionary is a game where I draw something and you have to guess what it is, right? There were a ton of Pictionary apps, and then Draw Something comes out, and it's less than all of them. Less features, less functions. Heck, there isn't even a winning lose. All it is, is is basically sitting on a tennis court volleying the ball back and forth with another player. There's no win or lose. Well, they won. They succeeded. Now, obviously, it had its day in the sun. It's not doing as well. Maybe Zynga messed it up. Who knows? Uh, but it succeeded. It was the fastest succeeding game ever in history, and it was simple. So on the iPhone, you've got the simplicity. And also, back in the 80s and 90s, we'd always talk about how can we get your mom to play games? How can we get... Joe Sixpack to play games. Well, they're playing games. Uh, we have games like Word Carnival and Crickler, where 85% of the audience is women, and most of those women are older women. That's extraordinary. That never happened. So games have now become part of our lives. I saw a graph of what people do in their mobile phones, randomly chosen, and the biggest time people spend their mobile phones now is games, and that's everyone. In Japan right now, there's a game called Puzzle and Dragons on mobile, that 10% of the population is pay playing. Let me make that clear. That's not 10% of iPhone users or Android users. 10% of the entire population of Japan is playing Puzzles and Dragons. And Puzzles and Dragons is simple. It's, we're going to make creatures that look like Pokemon creatures. You're going to fight them, and you're going to fight them using a game mechanic, which is a bejeweled, match-free crystal puzzle. And you're going to be able to create new monsters, right? Four, almost $4 million a day in revenue, and 10% of the population of Japan is playing that. When has it ever happened before that you have huge parts of the population playing these games? So that will increase. Where wearable computers like the Google Glasses go, either it's a big success or a big failure, who knows? It could be anything. I mean, that's about all i got for you, Bill. I'm kind of curious how you, how you uh, met the fat man. How what? Hey, what? How you know the fat man. Oh, the fat man. So, back in 1982, I take a position at that company doing the draw package and stuff at Valdox, you know, Rising Star. And I want to do a paint program. So I find this guy called Rick Sanger, who's about to go to the South Pole for the summer to work at the South Pole Research Station. And Rick wants to do the paint program. I say, Rick, why don't you get a computer called the Jupiter Ace? Take the Jupiter Ace, which runs forth, and write a paint program that we can eventually run on the Epson QX10. So he goes off to South to the South Pole, starts writing Val Paint, which I help him design. I'm working on Val Draw, the drawing, the drafting program, and we release Val Paint. And he has a brother. His brother's name George Sanger. And I hired George, and I hired George's wife at the time to do UI stuff. And also, I'm interested in music. I want to. I'm trying to get this QX10 to be a really cool computer, Epson QX10, you know, um, to be a really cool computer. And uh, I even have a color version of the QX10 that almost no one had. I had a version that had, this is in 1983, I had a 640 by 400 graphic, uh, eight color display thing with video coprocessor. It had the NEC uh, 7220 coprocessors, and it was great. And so I hired George. I hired George Sanger. I got George Sanger into the computer business. Um, 
I also had working with me at Rising Star, David Warhol, who had come from Mattel and would later on to go find real-time associates. Um, I was trying to do, sir, typically start a game division at, at, at Epson, at, at, at Rising Star. So I hired George to figure out cool music stuff that could be done on this machine and also to do UI design with his wife, Linda. Linda was his wife at the time. Um, so yeah, that's how I know George Sanger. I gave him the job in 1982, 83. 83. That's it. But a <laughs> well, was there anything else that you want to talk about that we haven't mentioned? I know you did some. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you the, uh, the, the, the coupons the, and the rude, <laughs> rude tones. And, yeah, the coupon thing was basically someone cornered me at a party and said, "Hey, you got to help this guy. He wants to do internet coupons." So I was finishing up at right at Lightspan in '99, and I took this job as CTO of the coupon thing. We got a million people on the coupon system. It's like 2000 is like the worst year of my life because two things happened. One. Save.com got to be very successful, but then was sort of blown up. Actually, almost was sold to another company for a lot of money, and, and I don't want to get into details, but it didn't happen. And Lightspan, which I left Activision to go to, went public. And for a while there, I was uh, very wealthy on paper. But unlike uh, other people, I was restricted. I couldn't sell my shares to August, and the entire stock market collapsed. So, yeah, I did, I did Save.com because... I understood the technical difficulties of launching a system that ran on browsers that allowed people to print grocery store coupons, and I could and I could design it, and I did. And I had a lot of people working with me. I helped do the patent application on that and all that, and it looked like a really good idea. It was kind of interesting. And um, and then everything blew up in 2000, and by then I'd been out of the mainstream video game industry for six years. So I went to do mobile games because of that. I got interested in mobile games because I knew what was going on in Japan with uh, Docomo, uh, NTT Docomo. I knew about things like location-based games that were happening in Japan in, in 2001, 2002. I started doing, I, th I did my first mobile game, produced my first mobile game in 2000, which was basically flashcards in WAP. And then I, oh, you haven't asked the crazy question. What is bonus mobile? What is the dozens? Do you know about this? That's the Wayans Brothers uh, game, right? It's the most. It was so cool and and yet so sad at the same time. We came up with this idea of doing a game based on Yo Mama insults, and we and the Wayans had a card game based on Yo Mama insults. So we actually built this game called The Dozens, which had player to player two player game on mobile phones, player to player text chat in the game, invites that came in as text messages. Invites the players that didn't even have the game. They could choose to download the game right then and there. It was actually pushed to them if they wanted it. Or they could play a short game strictly through text messages. There was a mobile web version. There was a J2ME version. There was a Brew version. It had graphics. It had animation. It was basically a war game. You had four or 12 card games. You were dealt the cards. The cards each had a point value. They had a Yo Mama joke. You'd throw down a card. The person would see the joke. They wouldn't see the point value, and they'd have to determine what card to play against you. And the strategy was to try to get them to waste their good cards on their bad cards and see if you could win, right? So far ahead of its time. And at the time, if you read the article, I, the quote I have in the uh, 148 app swing, the phone market was all controlled by the carriers. They owned it. So what we did is we wanted to get out of that. So what we did is we had the playing cards that Wayne's created. Every deck had a card that said, play to dozens on your phone. Text such and such to such and such. So far ahead of our time. And Sherry, who I had started working with just a few years before, now is CTO of uh, PlayScreen. She's in Oregon. She implemented this thing in such a way that you could literally be walking down the street, playing the game, turn your phone off for a loose connection, turn it back on again, run the game, and be back in the match with your other player. Holy cow, that was so ahead of its time. This thing should have been should have been the angry birds of its era. It was so far ahead of its time. There were beautiful animations, beautiful artwork and all that. And what went wrong is this. The Wayans are great, funny people, and they are a little bit over the top. So originally the idea was Tops, T O P P S, uh, who were publishing the game, wanted the game to go into Walmart, where it would have done well. But Walmart rejected it because it was too risky jokes, you know, sexually silly things. Um, and because of that, they decided to sell it through Blockbuster. It bombed. Plus, the people who were financing the company just ran out of steam. 
And so what we're seeing here with like, you know, the cure for cancer in gaming and mobile gaming in 2004 or five. I mean, we won awards and everything, and nothing happens. It's like, ah, that's so sad. Um, now, uh, so yeah, that's that. And then, and then before that, I'd actually done a multiplayer mobile game called uh, Spell Strike at a company called um, Technic Digital Arts that actually got released through the singular store, and then that company exploded. Because you have to understand, in 2003, 2004, 2005, everyone thought mobile games were a stupid thing. No one thought it was a smart idea. Even when we started doing iPhone stuff in 2007, I got the reason we I got a um, I have a rep at Apple. One of the reasons we have a rep at Apple is in 2007, EA was blasting the iPhone, saying it was a bad device, what a piece of junk. They were actually blasting it, and I was on the stage saying, "Look, I know it's only web-based right now, but if you take a look at our web-based bowling game and look at Jam That Bowling, I think we look really good. I think it looks really. I think it plays great and all that stuff, um, and." And it was hard to get people to believe in this stuff. So in 2004, 2005, we were absolutely crazy visionaries that no one really wanted to do. By the way, we did, a, we did an E3 show. The E3, we did E3 with a booth with the Wayans in the summer of 2005. That was cool. It was cool to meet them, cool to, to work with them. They were very funny, very smart. Geniuses, in, in fact. So, yeah. And you were asking about, uh, say, the Kong. What else were you asking about? Um, Besides that, oh, I gotta oh, give you a Rutons. story. Rutones was when I was at Bonus Mobile. I was in a conference call with a bunch of people. We were, you know, we we're talking about mobile and all that, and I belched really loudly on the phone. <laughs> and one of the guys says, "What was that?" And I go, "Oh, that was a Rutone." So they said, "Rutones? Let's let's trademark that. Let's do that." So we did Rutones. We did stupid ringtones. And by the way, my Numo, the company that be, that was purchased by PlayScreen, that did the first iPhone games, initially started out as a portal called MyNumo.com in 2006 and 2007, and that portal was a self-publishing portal for artists. You could create your own ringtones, your own wallpapers, your own mobile videos, and sell them to people on phones. So we actually had a plugin that went into MySpace that allowed independent artists to actually publish and make money off their ringtones and wallpapers and stuff. And we'd have crazy people making crazy ringtones. And it was, it was, once again, Sherry Kuno's brilliance that that happened. But the ringtone market quickly died. But it was a very cool, advanced idea. Um, here's the apolitical story, the greatest story of video games ever known that I'll tell you I'll end with. So I knew a guy at Activision in the 80s who I worked with at Aegis as well called John Skeel. Skeel's best known as being the producer of the first Mech Warrior game, which is a great game. So Skeel goes off to a comic show in New York, and he sees a new comic book in 88 or so, that looks really cool, and he basically handshakes a deal with them and saying, look, we'd like the worldwide video game rights to this, what would you sell the worldwide video game rights with? And, and being new to the business, these people said, we'll do it for $25,000. So he comes back to Activision, and Activision at the time, this is before Bobby, had a policy of running new ideas to a panel of teenage boys where they bring in the weekend and give them sodas and, and pizza, right? So they showed this comic book to the teenage boys, this, this concept. And the result is from the marketing group, and this is the best joke, teenage boys show little interest in anthropomorphic turtles. <laughs> so Activision turned down Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the whole license. Ooh, that hurts. Yeah. Cowabunga. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah it was, it was, that's the craziest story of the video game industry I have. I will say this much. The video game industry What did the, the boys 80s, say about it? Do you know? I, don't, I think they presented him wrong. They didn't explain it to him. They didn't let them just look at I don't know what went wrong there. I wasn't there, but I know the story, and it's crazy. Um, I, I actually, another story, Chris Garski, who's long name in the game industry, and I were at a meeting at Activision. We had just seen the Tracy Ullman show. And they just aired the first Simpsons mini thing in the Tracy Ullman show. And we said, the Simpsons is really awesome. We really need to get the Simpsons. And everyone thought we were wrong. Garski and I wanted to do the Simpsons so bad. And we, were, you know, we weren't voted. We were voted down on that. And the other thing was, Activision had the rights to do a game based on the Abyss, James Cameron's Abyss. The, um, the funny irony of that, they turned it down. But the irony of that, in, in 2000, I, in 2001, I met Sherry Quino working for James Cameron's Cameron was trying to do a YouTube meets the science fiction channel portal called Earthship TV. 
and Ursa TV was very cool. And I would post messages. You can actually look for messages on Usenet where I would post things. Does anyone know what the bandwidth is from the space station to the ground for like transmitting data? And people would go, why are you asking this? I was asking this because at the time, James Cameron was actually going to go up to the space station and shoot an IMAX film. And he wanted to have an avid editing system there so he could and have the dailies go down to Earth every day so people could see what was going on. And my job was to figure that out as well as um, figuring out how to do what was called spherical video. We had a system that had one, two, three, four, five, six cameras, and you'd shoot video. This is in um, 2000. You'd shoot video out of it from an airplane or whatever, and when you're watching the video, you could pan anywhere and look all over the place. And what's funny is Nintendo did that on the Wii U. There's an app on the Wii U that does exactly this with video. But um, I was trying to find a way of doing it with one lens because what eventually happened is James Cameron didn't go into space because someone else beat him to it. Some tourist, space tourist beat him to it. So instead they returned to the Titanic and I was trying to find a way of doing spherical video under the water and, and I, I found a guy who had a single lens that would do um, 360 this way and 340 this way, 340 this way, 360 this way. And we we're trying to figure out if we could put that into the submersibles. And I remember one of the people telling me, you understand you can't have any hollow pieces in the lens. And I go, why? He goes, because if the lens collapses at the depth of where these submarines are at the Titanic, the shockwave will explode the subs, kill people. So Sherry, actually, who's our CTO, actually worked out the streaming video system. So what they would do is they'd have these remote submersibles playing out fiber optics, which the Cameron genius has figured out. He's, one of his brothers is, a, is a, a genius in terms of devices. And they play out this one strand of fiber optic, and that would be piping the two high-def videos back to the submarine. And then they would send the stream up to the surface, and then satellite from the ship would go to a, to a satellite, and then would go to a facility in, in um, El Segundo, and they would edit it and stuff, and within an hour it was on the Internet. So they were doing live one-hour delay broadcasting from the submarine, and Sherry was the person who pulled together that digital video streaming thing. And that's how we met working. We became, you know, we've worked together all those years uh, starting at um, Airship TV. Yeah. In 2000, 2001. Yeah. So that's it, yeah. Is there anything out there right now that you're looking at and thinking, man, this is going to really take off? <laughs> no, I'm trying to think. I'll tell you what really has impressed the freak out of me. There is a app, an educational game. It's called Dragon Box. It's a game where you have uh, two sides of the screen, and you have objects, and your attempt is to remove many of them possible by dragging the objects around, and there are rules. Well, this is algebra. It's algebra hidden. It doesn't use numbers. It uses symbols, but it's algebra. It doesn't use A, B, C, or D. It uses pictures of creatures and stuff, but it's algebra. And four-year-olds are using Dragon Box and learning algebra, absolutely learning algebra. I look at Dragon Box, and I go, this is pretty impressive. And then I realize that every part of education that's out there could be transitioned to this. We could transition our entire educational paradigm into one of play. Right now, education in America is sort of like the beatings will continue until morale improves. It's all that's moved more towards standardized testing. It's more drill and kill. Um, and you've got to be careful about this because one of the things that's uh, a story that's floating around about this crash, and I, was, I flew into San, San Francisco on Monday afternoon, and when I landed in San Francisco, as the plane was landing, I could see the burned out wreckage of the plane that had crashed. And one of the stories that's out there, and you can Google this, is from a trainer, an American trainer who trained these pilots. And he says the problem they had is they were so accustomed to rote learning. They were magnificent students, but they were so accustomed to rote, rote learning, it doesn't prepare them for things like, the, like that could happen in an airplane. It's a problem. So rather than just pigeonholing education, games like Dragon Box, and, th and I can envision tons of these. And I actually floated a business plan years ago to do this. I think what's going to happen is this. Schools are going to adopt tablets in a big way because in the long run it's going to save them money. Even if they have to replace the tablets every year, but you know, 
a ruggedized tablets as a school device is a brilliant idea because you can do books and you can do books that allow annotations but more importantly stuff like dragon box could happen and dragon box blew me away because why couldn't you do that with everything why couldn't you do that with all of math science reading why couldn't you make it all together that's what lightspan was trying to do on the playstation one we were trying to basically create games that actually did hard curriculum things but dragon box is like you look at this and go this this is this works and there's no reason why it can't work for everything so that blew me away and, and I, I was at a, a meeting this um week and i talked to some venture capitalists and i said what do you anticipate happening here? And they basically said, well, the rich parents will get it and no one else will. And that's sad. Equally impressive, related to this, is what one laptop per child did. They shipped a bunch of Android tablets to a remote village in Ethiopia or Sudan, one of those countries, with no instructions. And the tablets were locked. They couldn't do a lot of things, but they could run some apps. The kids figured out how to use them, and they actually hacked them. They hacked them so they could get the camera app working. This is actually a documented story. So they were basically functionally illiterate children living in a remote area of Africa, handed these tablets and figured it all out and were learning things and doing things. It's like, why do we have this paradigm? Like Einstein used to say, if you force feed a lion steak every day, eventually we'll hate steak. Kids come to school, they're excited about school and stuff, and we kill that enthusiasm. Stuff like Dragon Box, stuff like, the, you know, Angry Birds is a physics game. It doesn't take much to take Angry Birds and turn it into a physics lesson. You know, momentum and uh, conservation of energy and trajectories and so on. You know, there's lots of things you can do, and I hope that this takes, gets taken up because it would really, it's really sad we're in the state we're in in education. We're really producing uh, we really have a problem you know when I taught when I was at University of New Hampshire grad school doing those games for Avalon Hill I would teach um, astronomy lab and these are this is in the 80s I don't think the situation's getting any better students would come into class and you know uh, you know equation like that they could not plug values for X and get Y they couldn't do it they were basically mathematically illiterate and in terms of writing ability um, they were pretty bad also. I would actually recommend to anyone who wants to get in the game industry, you must learn how to write. Um, it really helps. I, I owe a lot of success because I went to a school that was a liberal arts curriculum. Yes, my degree was physics and astronomy, but I was forced to take a full liberal arts uh, curriculum, including writing papers that would... I remember I wrote a paper in a class on Shakespeare, my first paper at Penn. I wrote this 10-page paper, typed it up. We didn't have word processors, so I typed it up on this electric, right? Handed it to the professor. When I came back to get the paper, you know what he did? Do it over. Tore it up in front of me and said, do it over. This is terrible writing. Get drunk and write. Learn how to write. That's, and, I, and I can write. You know, I can write for a living if I have to. Uh, and that's an important ability to do a game. So I'm, I'm, I guess the thing that most impressed me is that People were able to do things with tablets. Like, we have one game called Word Carnival. It's just a word-finding game, but someone told me that their child has dyslexia, and because the game always has easy words, because the board is always changing, there's always an easy word waiting for you. You don't have to go for complicated words. Their kid was able to progress. And my videographer comes from the Dominican Republic. English is the second language. He used to score 40 and 50 points. Now he's in the top 10 all the time. 700, 800 points in Word Carnival. He literally improved his English skills just by playing the game. And Luminosity, of course, is touting this with adults with their Luminosity site, but I keep saying, tablets are going to take over in schools. This could happen. It could be really good. It's, it's um, yeah, it's, when times are tough, I always remind myself that I've been in the business a long time, and it's kind of cool that I've been in the business a long time, and it's nice to, to be able to actually sit back and look at the span of 30 years in the game business and just see an industry grow from nothing to something extraordinary, bigger than the movie business. That's pretty cool. I go to E3 and I'm like, yeah, big smile on my face because it's fun, you know? It's cool stuff. So we go to places like that, do people recognize you and ask for your, your autograph? Or oh, you? my God. I was in line at a taco stand at one conference, and a guy named uh, Dan Winters is in line, 
And he goes, yeah, Bill saved Activision. He was like, he's an Activision. He's like, well, Bill saved Activision. Return of Zork saved Activision. This man, he was crazy. Because I was really eccentric back then. I, I, I was, well, for one, I was 120 pounds heavier. And I was an uber nerd. And so Dan Winters is going on and on about how crazy I was at Activision, but also saying to people, oh, yeah, Return of Zork was really important. Activision was in Chapter 11. Return of Zork did really well. It was an important title. And, you know, it's kind of cool, you know, but, uh, and yes, and I told you before, I have been at a bar in San Francisco once where someone said, want some rye and handed me a rye, rye whiskey. That was, that was awesome, you know, and I didn't even come to that line. That's Eddie Dumbrower. Eddie Dumbrower, the producer of Return of Zork, the creator of Earl Weaver Baseball. It's his line, but I, because I, I'm associated with the game, I get, that happens to me sometimes. Um, and then finally, once I was at a furniture store about four years ago. And I walk in, and there's a kid behind the desk playing on an Apple II, and uh, he's playing my game. And that was like, what? Why? Why is he playing Conflict 2100 in 2004, 2008, whatever, you know? It's funny. Yeah. Yeah, but it's fun. There's a lot of possibilities, a lot of... But Tanel's right. The iPhone market is terribly hard. He's absolutely right. Tell him I said so if you ever talk to him. Oh, yeah, sure. All right. All right. Well, I'll let you, let you get back to your coffee and your, your bicycle probably, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. i got to do more wording, writing and stuff. And uh, most of what I do is write nowadays. I mean, that's really my job. I mean, I, I haven't programmed in a while, although I kind of miss it sometimes. And I'm not an artist, so I basically work on the stuff that has to go along with all that, you know? So it's kind of cool. That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week, and I've got a hell of a show there for you. It's going to be a retrospective of a game called Tales of Illyria. And this is just something I, I'm really just, I love in this game, and I'm really looking forward to sharing it with you. Unfortunately, I've hit a bit of a snag, technically, uh, and I need your help. Uh, basically, okay, let me just uh, try to make this brief. So, the developer sent me this Android tablet so I could play his game. It's a Nexus 7, and the game works great, but the only problem is I haven't been able to find a way to uh, get the video out of this thing and into my computer so I can record it. I actually ordered a little adapter thing from Amazon that apparently did what I needed it to do, but it just didn't work at all. Uh, he's sending me something else to try, but in the meantime, if you happen to have this Nexus 7 tablet and you know how to do uh, how to get the video into the computer, uh, please let me know about that and <laughs> make my life a lot easier. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to have the video camera there, and it's going to be pretty cheesy. Uh, so thanks in advance uh, if you can help me with that. Uh, in other news, I am setting up my own uh, uh, website for the show. It's called uh, going to be matchat.us. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, the host, I guess, is having some problems at the moment. Uh, the server's down. <laughs> you know, what, what can you do? It's just, uh, you know, bad timing on my part, I guess, with this. So I won't be able to show it to you. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, that's, that'll be the sort of hub, and I'll have all the audio podcasts there, the uh, notes about the shows, the, the PayPal stuff, the books, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, will be there, and I, I'm really looking forward to to it. I think you guys will really enjoy the site. So hopefully uh, next week I'll have more information on that. Uh, in the meantime, though, if you do want to support the show, you can always go to that uh, link at Armchair Arcade. Hopefully it will still be there uh, in the meantime. And if you need to get in touch with me, i got the uh, Facebook page as well as the Twitter page and the Google Plus and all of those things, uh, as well as, uh, of course, the YouTube channel. So uh, keep in touch. All right, let's see what else I've... Oh, the ale of the week. Oh, man, I've got a... Woo, just let me show you this one. Uh, wow, look look at this. Uh, this is... <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is... What could be more appropriate? We have the uh, Trooper uh, Robert from uh, Robinson's Brewery. This is a, a British beer, and as you can see, it's the Iron Maiden uh, beer. Actually, is uh, uh, Bruce Dickinson himself, apparently, is a, a really into beer... I'm trying to read between the lines here. I can't. I haven't been able to figure out if he actually created the brew, or just sort of uh, inspired, or he liked it, and selected it. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, it's. Uh, it tells you a little bit about the charge of the Light Brigade, which is the, you know, symbolism that's in the on this uh, logo here, as well as the album cover. And uh, let's see what else is here. Uh, Four point seven percent alcohol by volume. And Robinson's Brewery is out of, uh, 
Where is it? <laughs> oh, there we go. Unicorn Brewery, Stockport, Cheshire. Probably not saying that right. Cheshire, Cheshire, SK1 UK. Product of England. Okay. Anyway, I'm really excited. Uh, you put something about Iron Maiden on the bottle, and you know I'm going to try it. So anyway, let's get the trooper open and see if it lives up to the Iron Maiden name. All right, so I've got some of this trooper here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> I'm smelling this and trying to decide what it smells like. You definitely get the cherry uh, aroma. That's really kind of what I'm smelling more than anything. Sort of like a like a big bowl of uh, chocolate covered cherries, if you will. It's a very sweet aroma. Well, let's give it a taste. <laughs> Get up. It's, it's, it's very thick and very uh, flavorful. You definitely, it's sort of hitting those lighter notes. Uh, you got sort of that, uh, actually do get kind of a cherry taste. A little bit of hops, a little bit of bitterness, um, but really just kind of a sweetness that's going with this. I can't really think of what uh, this tastes like exactly. Uh, you do taste a little bit of a uh, hoppiness. I, I don't want to say it's mild because there's a lot of flavor here, uh, but I'm definitely not getting a you know, rushed with alcohol or sort of a heavy uh, flavor that really stands out above the rest. Get sort of the cherries and hops uh, with this. A little bit of a, maybe a, maybe a little bit of a licorice uh, kind of uh, nuttiness uh, flavor to it. Uh, anyway, it's just really, really good. I'm going to have to give this uh, one more taste. <sighs> you, know, I, you know, I do think Bruce uh, must have as good of a a taste for ale as he does with music because it's really really nice i i just you know i can't complain about this at all a very solid choice i'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on this uh, definitely a really exceptional ale uh, that i really enjoy and i'm sure it has nothing to do with all the iron maiden uh, logos and associations on it of course not okay let's wrap this up uh, with a quotation and i've got a quotation here from a comedian named Ron White. And it goes something like this. I believe that if life gives you lemons, you should make lemonade. And try to find somebody whose life has given them vodka and have a party. See you guys next week. Talking about the audience, I, these guys come across, you know, most of the, the fans in the audience are guys. Yeah. They come across well, as well, know, well, but, yeah. well, there might be a couple of girls that claim to show you. No, I think there's, there's quite a few girls out there. If you go and have a look. I quite will. A few girls I, we out we there. will be going out. You're right, yeah, I know you. They, they seem pretty aggressive. Go and talk to the communards. <laughs>